This episode of Paranormal Skeptic Academy is brought to you by the Secular Outreach Network. Find out more at secularoutreachnetwork.com. This is Paranormal Skeptic Academy Using critical thinking and scientific evidence To analyze your favorite ghost hunting shows You'll never view them the same again You have been warned (laughs) In the season premiere the team goes back to the Pacific Northwest to determine if the US or Canada has more evidence of Bigfoot activity. The team splits up to interview witnesses and conduct nighttime investigations on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington and in British Columbia, Canada. This is Paranormal Skeptic Academy. This is the season that is supposed to make believers out of skeptics. Or so the TV commercials proclaim. I don't have high hopes. Call me skeptical. I'm open to hear what they have to say, or better yet, see what they have to show, but if the earlier seasons are any indication, I'm not holding my breath. The gimmick for this episode is US versus Canada to see which country has more Sasquatch sightings will be taken away to northern Washington state in the U.S. and British Columbia, Canada. Apparently, this is the area of the country that gave us the legend of Bigfoot. We know this because native people said so, and we have to believe them because they were here first. The team will divide into two teams, with one team led by Bobo, thinking Washington has more Bigfoots, and the other team led by Cliff, thinking Canada has more Bigfoots. In the end, they're all losers. We are told they will consult experts in the field, and by experts, they mean fellow believers. As these experts pop up, I'll do my best to get some background on each of them, at least briefly. This episode originally aired on January 1st, 2016 on Animal Planet, and sadly, Finding Bigfoot is one of their highest rated shows. Me personally, I'm more partial to Treehouse Master. So how about it? You ready to tighten your boots, throw on your backpack, grab some sunscreen and insect repellent, and go international squatch hunting? Too bad. You're coming with me on this episode of Paranormal Skeptic Academy Squatch Wars, U.S. versus Canada. Ooh, I'm a ghost. Ooh, I'm a ghost of podcasting future. And unless you want Bob Marley to show up and beat your ass with some chains, you should check out Waiting for Wrath, where we talk about not chasing ghosts or people who think they're chasing ghosts, but rather <laughs> flaming on the stupidity that we find in everyday life. Join us at WaitingForWrath.com or on iTunes and Stitcher by searching for Waiting for Wrath. Four, like the number. Like there's four hosts on our show. <laughs> we're witty. We are, and we're, we're, we're so amazing. Or I'm just really drunk. I haven't decided yet. On this special episode of Finding Bigfoot. This is a privilege, man. This is where Sasquatch, the word itself, came from. Native legends tell of a large hair-covered creature that has roamed the Pacific Northwest for centuries. Now... It's a Squatch War in the Pacific Northwest, settling the long-standing debate among the team. Which is Squatchier, U.S. or Canada? I just heard a knock. I'm not kidding, man. To find out, the team splits up and chooses sides. USA! USA! Meeting with experts in the field. One would be surprised if there weren't Sasquatch report. Pulling out some old tricks. Welcome to the camp, smelly hippie. And some new ones. Squatch ain't always pretty, but today it is. All in an attempt to win the Battle of the Bigfoots and prove which country is really the squatchiest place on Earth. 
What is that? That clearly had legs. Yeah, there it is. It's a squatch off, U.S. versus Canada, or at least a territorial showdown. We're about to find out which location has the most squatch sightings. See, I used the term sighting because that's all the evidence we have for Sasquatch. This little debate seems to be only important to the guys on the team, and the rest of us couldn't care less which territory they think has more squat sightings. Matt narrates a flyover of some beautiful green scenery and tells us this part of the country is the best Sasquatch habitat in the world. There's no objective measure of this, just his own personal observation. Matt also lets us know that Sasquatches here have over 70,000 square miles to hide in, which probably explains the lack of evidence, right? Matt also lets us know that Bigfoot research has been occurring for over 50 years on the American side, and Bigfoot research has been occurring on the Canadian side since the 1930s. I guess I'm supposed to be impressed by that. And the genesis of this episode? Cliff and Bobo have a bet about which territory has more Squatch sightings. Bobo and Renee are staying in Washington, and Matt and Cliff are heading across the border to Canada. Let's hear from the team and why they think they are correct in their assumptions about these territories. Bobo and I made a bet and I'm going to back it up. So I've chosen British Columbia in Canada. It's not a question of whether Sasquatches live in Canada. I mean, after all, the word Sasquatch itself came from the Stahelis First Nations people in British Columbia. There are written reports from that area that date more than 30 years before Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin got their film. I mean, there's a Sasquatch Mountain, there's a Sasquatch Provincial Park, but really there's no convincing Bobo that British Columbia might be better, so I just have to go up there and show him myself. Does, does Cliff think the Patterson video is real? My oh my, Cliffy boy. All evidence points to that video being faked. He should go back and listen to the PSA Weekly Update from August 7, 2015, where I go over the evidence for the film. Bring it on, Cliff. I'm not afraid of you or your bet. I've been squashing here in the Olympics for 20 years. I got this place wired. I'm so confident I'm going to handicap myself by bringing a skeptic, Renee. But I'll balance that out by bringing Monkey, the squatching dog. You don't bet against the Bobes. Bobo is basing his assumption off of experience and is so confident he's bringing Renee, the skeptic. Bobo and Cliff have had an ongoing debate about where the squatchiest place in North America is. Now, I know the Olympic Peninsula better than any of these guys, and I'm ready to defend the honor of my home state of Washington. And I'm really looking forward to winning this prize and finding that evidence that proves to me that Sasquatches are real. I think it's pretty telling that after eight seasons, Renee is still not convinced that Sasquatch are real. What of all the evidence they collected over the years? Is Renee in denial? or is the evidence non-existent? Bobo says he's been hunting for evidence of Bigfoot in Washington for years, even going as far as saying he saw one in 2004. 20 years of searching and you've only had one sighting? But this episode is about a bet, so let's see what the stakes are. This is an ordinary wood knocker. This is a signed bat from Dustin Pedroia, future Hall of Famer for the Boston Red Sox game used bat, autograph, to Bobo, keep it squatchy. Dustin Pedroia. It's pretty cool that I like Pedroia's into the squatch. So we were in New England, I cruised down to Fenway and dropped it in saw. Dustin gave me a signed autographed bat that actually has a Bigfoot on the bottom of the handle. This is definitely one of my most cherished Bigfoot items. I'd hate to lose it, but I ain't gonna because I'm not gonna lose this bet. I'll see that and raise you an original London cast from the ground. This is number two. Back in winter of 2012, I was called in to investigate a long trackway of possible Sasquatch footprints in London, Oregon. I ended up casting 72 of them. The London trackway is one of the best documented finds in all Bigfoot history. These 72 casts go together, so to break up the set would just be heart-wrenching for me. So this is no longer a gentleman's bet. This is war. It was up to me. I'd take the bet. I can fake Bigfoot tracks on my own. Now, since this is a bet, we have to have rules to determine who actually wins. Now these rules are a good example of the value they place on what they consider the best evidence for Bigfoot. Okay, so that's our bet. An original cast from London, Oregon versus a Dustin Pedroia bat that he actually used in a game. Oh yeah. Okay, Bobo, these are the rules. Believable witnesses, one point. 
Sounds in the woods at night, two points apiece. Footage, a thousand points, you automatically win. <laughs> there you go. All right, then, Cliff, shake on a gentleman's bet. All right. USA. 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 So, sounds and credible witnesses. That's pretty much every Finding Bigfoot episode. How do they know the difference between normal forest sounds and Bigfoot? And a credible witness? How do you determine if a witness is credible? That is the extent of their evidence. They find someone who they think is credible and count that as a hit. First up is Cliff and Matt in BC. Matt mentions J.W. Burns, who was a teacher on the Sahelis Indian Reservation in British Columbia. He documented eyewitness accounts of giant hairy Indians. The term Sasquatch comes from his writings, most likely a mispronunciation of an Indian word. This happened in 1929, and even way back then, all they had was eyewitness accounts. Cliff is using this historic anecdote to base his assumptions about the Sasquatch activity in BC. Cliff and Matt arrive at a First Nations people reserve, where he says the term Sasquatch originated. They are greeted by a native dance about Sasquatch. We've arranged a meeting with a couple of the tribal elders, and apparently they have something special in store for us. Dances like this not only serve to strengthen the cultural bond of the Staheli's people themselves, but it also teaches the watchers of the dance about the creatures that the dance is about. First, the adult Sasquatch comes out and makes sure that everything is safe. Then he invites the young out to follow him around. In this case, the dancer that is emulating the Sasquatch is doing some really interesting things. He's looking over his shoulder behind him all the time, showing that Sasquatches are very wary and hard to sneak up on. He's cupping his hand as he's moving around, just like Sasquatches are often reported to do. Thank you. That was fantastic. You can tell this culture's knowledge of the Sasquatch runs very, very deep. Look, I'm not one to make fun of someone else's culture and I respect native cultures, but there's a long way from respecting a culture to believing everything they have to say about nature. Just because they have this dance doesn't mean Bigfoot is real. It's not evidence of anything. We are told that the most infamous name, Sasquatch, comes from this tribe, and we are also told that most native cultures have a name for this large hairy creature. Again, this may be true, but this isn't evidence of Bigfoot. It's evidence of a shared cultural belief. But as is typical, this is enough for Matt to be convinced. He's right. Every indigenous culture we've come across has their own name for it. But Sasquatch is probably the best known name outside of the word Bigfoot. That's why it's so important for us to come up here and meet with the Stahelis band to find out about their traditions and see their Sasquatch dance and hear their stories. All of that could provide clues into the behavior of Sasquatches that may help us encounter one here. Matt uses these cultural references to learn about the behavior of Bigfoot. He has to because he doesn't have anything else to base their behavior on. One of the tribe members said that in order to see a Sasquatch, you have to be in the right place, at the right time, and in the right frame of mind. Uh, yeah, okay, I guess timing is everything, and our team must have some really shitty timing after eight seasons and no solid evidence. We shift focus and meet up with Bobo and Renee. They are meeting a woman and her young son. The woman swears she has heard knocking in the woods and that her young son has actually seen a Bigfoot. Are we to assume this preteen is a credible witness? Let's find out. How familiar are you guys with the woods? Did you just move out here? Is this your first time living in the woods? I've lived out in this area for almost 18 years. Melissa, have you heard anything? Yeah, I've heard um, lots of branches snapping. We've heard a few screaming kind of noises that aren't identifiable. A lot of noise I've heard is, comes down from by the river, and I've heard um, some tree knocking. Is that one solid rap or is it multiple knocks? Multiple, maybe three. Yeah. Something like that? Yeah. So, Colton, you actually saw something here. In the woods back in there. Okay, will you show us? Yeah. Let's go check it out. As I spoke with Melissa, I started learning more about her background. 
she grew up in places even more remote than this. I mean, we're off grid here, deep in the woods. She said this is nothing. She's been in the woods her whole life. And she knows all the sounds of all the known animals in the peninsula. And the whoops, howls, knocks, and screams she heard, she couldn't attribute to anything else but a Bigfoot. Look, I'm sure this lady has good intentions. Bobo seems to think that because this lady has lived in the woods for 18 years, this makes her an expert on woodland sounds. Really? He also says she knows the sounds of all known creature in the woods around her house. You don't say. You see what they're doing here, right? They're trying to build the credibility of this witness, puffing her up to something she isn't. An expert. The boy says he saw this thing, so he takes him into the woods to describe what he saw. So Colton, what were you doing that day before you saw it? Were you making a lot of noise or were you being quiet? What was happening? I was making a lot of noise, hitting sticks on trees. And I saw something up there in the corner of my eye. It was a big, enormous, bulky thing crouching down, eating. And then it got up and grunted at me. So I ran into the house. You never looked back? Mm -mm. So you were scared? Yeah, I was speechless. They are building a case that knocking on a tree is a way Bigfoots communicate, as they've had in past episodes. Something they tried to establish in the very first episode of Finding Bigfoot, and something Matt brags about discovering. Never mind the fact that they are relying on a child as an eyewitness to substantiate their claims. Now, of course, Bobo has to go into the trees and try to reenact what this boy saw. Plus, he wanted to find out what this Bigfoot was eating. Bobo gets in place and does this size comparison gimmick, and of course what the boy saw is bigger than our Bobo, so I guess we're counting this as evidence. Now, am I just that picky, or is there evidence just that bad? Renee, could you please say something intelligent? Ten-year-olds are known to have big imaginations, so I'm wondering if that's the case more than him actually seeing a Bigfoot. Thank you, Renee. But Bobo is sure convinced that this boy saw a Sasquatch. One point for Team USA. Believable witness. Yep, that counts as a credible witness. Let that sink in for a minute. A preteen boy that saw something out of the corner of his eye in the woods counts as a credible witness. Are you ready to move on now? Good. With that, Team USA is up one point. Now it's Cliff and Matt's turn to find a credible witness, and it's a lady named Viola that saw a Sasquatch while she was picking berries. Oh, when did she see this Sasquatch? Many years ago when she was a young girl. Yep, time is the enemy of memory. Cliff sees this as an opportunity to learn about the feeding habits of Bigfoots, as well as score points for a credible witness. So what happened that day you had this encounter we heard about? Well, um... I got up, I went into the kitchen, I looked at my grandma and she just gestured towards the cans that I normally use to go pick in any cayenne berries. I grabbed them, walked out the door, I'll be back when I'm done. There's a meadow with big patches of huckleberries. So I grabbed my can, started filling that up, and then I started to come down a the hill. Then the bushes were moving. I said my little prayer put my can down, told him that's yours. They you could us. see it? You could look up I at this point and you'd see it? Almost as if right there. How many times have you seen Sasquatches? Every time I'm walking out in the woods, I'm always hearing one, knowing there's one near. Really, they're just around all the time? All the time. So she met a Sasquatch on a trail and gave it her berries. She says every time she goes into the woods, she's hearing Sasquatch noises and feels their presence. That is all the evidence she can provide. Cliff politely asks if he and Matt can investigate the woods on this lady's property, and she gives them permission. We are also told that Cliff scores one point for a credible witness. So if you're keeping score at home, it's now tied one to one. The sun goes down and the moon comes up, and we are with Cliff and Matt in B.C., looking for Sasquatches in the dark. 
Cliff is super pumped to be investigating on tribal land. Cliff and Matt head in opposite directions. Matt spots some bear shit, which is a sign bears are in the area. He radios Cliff and Cliff wants to howl at Matt. It echoes longer and louder than natural, so it was probably enhanced in post-production. Matt heard the call and returns the favor with his own howl. He gets the same echo, and then they wait. For something to happen. We jump back to Bobo and Renee. They're in the dark, just starting their investigation. Now, they mention something that's pretty telling. It's very dark, and they're under a thick canopy of trees. Renee mentions she can barely see her hand in front of her face. How the hell are they going to see a Bigfoot clearly under these conditions? They have to rely on their cameras to get anything resembling a clear image. And even then, they're looking through a small viewfinder. Bobo also brought his dog, Monkey, with him on this trip. As he's complaining about how much noise the dog is making, he hears something off into the distance. Bobo seems to think it's closer than it really is. Now, I hear trickling water as they're probably near a stream. And if they're in a canyon, that's going to echo pretty loudly. Renee then thinks she heard a knock, because we're just going to assume that's what Bigfoots do. Renee wants to do a few knocks herself, and whips out a small bat, and hits a nearby tree a few times. They wait, and hear nothing in response. Bobo wants to combine knocks and howls, but before they do that, we cut back to Cliff and Matt. Matt howls into the night once again, and then this exchange happens. Oh, there he is. That's a long ways away. I caught that last one on the very furthest reaches of my hearing. What? Dude, I'm too far away. There's no way you could have heard it. What did you hear? It sounded like quiet, distant, sustained echo of your howl. You know what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned that maybe you didn't hear me, but you heard something responding to me that's in between us, because I'm an awful long way from you. I'll tell you what, do one more, and I'll tell you if I hear it. Good idea. I swear it's just right on the edge, man. Wait. Cliff heard Matt during the first howling session, and then he does it again, and Cliff barely hears him. But Matt is just so sure that he's too far away, and that it must be something or someone responding to him. Cliff tells him to do it again, and then he barely hears it again. <laughs> you see, this is about as scientific as you're going to get with Matt Moneymaker. Why was he so convinced Cliff couldn't hear him when Cliff said he could barely hear him? Because he wants her to be a Bigfoot so bad that he'll just say stupid shit like he just did. But before we know the results of their little test, we head back to Bobo and Renee in Washington. Renee is tasked with howling in the dark, and right after she does it, they hear a generator kick on, and they see a spotlight start searching the area that they're in. Everyone ducks down, even the cameraman and the producer. Let's do one more. One, two, three. Oh, oh, f oh this is too nice. Is that it's the other? Is it come up here? It's right there. It's like spotlight. I'll keep coming here. So Renee and I are doing whoops. Next thing this big old generator fires up right below us. This hunting spotlight turns on, starts raking the treetops all around us, and zeroes in right on us. I'm thinking, uh oh, here it comes, gunshots next. Here it comes, here it comes. Josh, get lower. We can't hide here. I gave us permission to be. We gotta go. I fear this guy's gotta be freaking out just hearing squash calls coming from right above him. I thought for sure we were going to start hearing gunshots any second, so we decided to just turn around and head back down the hill towards camp. But there's no sense of getting shot out here. We already got two points for the knocks earlier. We've been out here most of the night. May as well just call to win and turn in. Two points for Team USA. Audio evidence. You see, here's the problem with this. They think they're in some remote area, and it turns out they're right next to a hunting stand. They hightail it out of there before getting a cat busted in their ass. But I must have missed something. Somehow, they get two points for knocks. What knocks? I didn't hear anything. They called it audio evidence? What kind of Bush League Sasquatch game is this? These guys are worse than ghost hunters. 
All right, we're back with Cliff and Matt, and they're back together with zero evidence, and they begin to wonder why. Cliff is confident that the town hall meeting in the morning will prove useful for narrowing down an area to search. Now, back in Washington, Bobo and Renee are heading off to meet Joe Bendernagel, who is a wildlife biologist and believes that Bigfoots exist. He's been searching for Bigfoot since 1963, and all he has to show for his efforts are cast of footprints and that he thinks he heard a Bigfoot in 1992. John wants more serious scientists to pay more attention to Bigfoots, but believes there's a bias amongst the scientific community, saying, quote, The evidence doesn't get scrutinized objectively. We can't bring the evidence to our colleagues because it's perceived as tabloid. End quote. Now, I can't speak for scientists, because I'm not one. But if you want your evidence to be taken seriously, publish your findings in a peer-reviewed journal. Don't just say you saw or heard something. Do the research and publish your findings. And I'm not talking about in a book. Bobo and Renee are hoping to get some intel on the best places to hunt for these creatures. And John is here to help. If we accept that they exist, they certainly exist on West Coast clam beaches, and they certainly feed on them. Clam beaches really interest me because clam beaches figure highly with Sasquatch reports, especially in winter when the low tides are at night, so they can be on the beaches unobserved, and Aboriginal clam diggers encounter them, have stones thrown at them, hear vocalizations. They know what's there, and they say, OK. Yeah, you hear that from California all the way to Alaska, you hear those reports. In their culture, it's just normal. Notice John said, if we accept that they exist. That is the key right there. You have to accept that these creatures exist in order to believe in them. You should accept that they exist based on the evidence presented. You can state your premise by saying, if we accept that they exist, and say pretty much anything after that. It doesn't make what you said true. You can say, if we accept that fairies exist, this is what they would behave like. That doesn't make fairies real. John also makes mention of native people and their experiences. Again, he's using this as evidence when it's clearly not. It's just personal anecdotal experience. We're told they eat a variety of meats and berries to include a bunch of fish. Now, let's accept that these things exist. And they're as large as Bobo thinks they are. Imagine the amounts of calories and protein needed just to fuel their bodies on a daily basis. If the average human needs to consume around 2,000 calories a day, how much do you think a Sasquatch would have to consume? They would need to be eating constantly, and if their population is large enough to find healthy breeding pairs, we should be seeing scat evidence all over, and even evidence of food debris left behind. But we don't. We have zero scat evidence from these creatures. Plus, they would be competing for food with other animals in the area. It's just not plausible. Bobo wants John to help him gather evidence so the USA could win, even though John is Canadian. John says that when it comes to Canadians, they're very conservative when it comes to Bigfoot, and Americans tend to be more gullible. <laughs> I mean, open to the idea. So I guess USA number one? Now apparently John is one of the most credible scientists that investigate the existence of Bigfoot, but he falls for the same traps that Bobo and the team fall for. Here he is describing a recent sighting. Well, I, it sounds bad, but you know, one would be surprised if there weren't Sasquatch reports on some of these really salmon-rich areas. I think the most recent one is the one of Sam the police chief and Jennifer, who are very credible eyewitnesses. Chief of police? Yeah, I mean, doesn't get any better than that, does no. it? No. Oh my. A police chief? What could be better? Maybe a priest? Again, with the credible eyewitness. This isn't evidence. Stop using it as if it is. All right, we leave Bobo and Renee and John and join Cliff and Matt in their car as they head to their next location. They're discussing where they should do their next investigation, and they want to find a place that has the best resources for Bigfoot. I'm assuming food. To gather the proper intel, they call a town hall meeting of local yokels. You know, that terrain in there, Cliff, I'm so surprised we didn't hear more back up in that valley. The Bigfoots just were not in that valley last night. You know there's tons of animals around here, but they must all be kind of concentrating somewhere, just like what humans do. They're going to go where everything's kind of bubbling up when we have all the best resources and nutrients in the same spot. It's going to be interesting to see where the sighting clusters actually pop up. Maybe somewhere not near this preserve has the magic ingredients that's going to make Bigfoots show up reliably. 
We're holding this town hall in the Stahelis Healing and Wellness Center, which is right in the reserve and right in the area where so many of those historical reports and the word Sasquatch came from. Now this is interesting. This area is known for its Sasquatch sightings, and I'm sure they attract a lot of tourists because of it. So there is a vested financial interest in keeping this myth alive. So Cliff and Matt call this town hall meeting, and who do you think will show up? People who believe Bigfoot to be real. Cliff and Matt are standing in front of the room, and Cliff asks if anyone has had a Sasquatch experience. There looks to be about 30 to 50 people there, and about half raise their hands, as best as I can tell. One guy stands up and says he encountered a Bigfoot on a biking trail, and it came charging at him and his wife. He describes the creature as being gray with long fur. Next, a couple stands up to describe their encounter. They were camping at a lake, and the man was taking pictures with his cell phone. They think they got a photo of the Sasquatch, but it's really just a blurry photo of something brown far back into the woods. Next, a guy tells his story about seeing a Sasquatch while fishing. He notices something on the rocks playing in the water, and dude thinks it's a black bear, until he said it stood up and walked back into the woods. Tonight's town hall meeting was as good as we expected. We had a variety of reports, everything from sightings. Oh, I was like, what the heck is this? It was freaky. To sounds. I had a few audio recorders set out, so I got, I got the whoops recorded. To footprints. This is the one that it got. And more. Darren said, I'll get rid of them, and he took his very large rifle and bam, bam, up in the air. Didn't matter how many bullets I had or how large my gun was, I did not feel safe. The stories we've chosen to follow up on are Todd's story when he saw that big gray thing running down the hill at he and his wife while biking, and also Maria and Rob's story. They have a photograph of what might be a Bigfoot, so Matt and I clearly need to go there and figure out if it is one or not. With that intel gathered, we jump back to Bobo and Renee as they meet their next eyewitness. I asked Dr. Bidinago for some real solid witnesses we could follow up with, and he recommended Sam and Jenny. They're both lifelong residents and tribal members raised traditionally, and Sam's actually the chief of police of Port Gamble. You can't ask for much better credentials than a guy that's a lifelong hunter, tribal member, and a chief of police, and that's a pretty solid resume. Again, they are stressing the importance of credentials when it comes to eyewitnesses, which means nothing to me. I want to know what evidence you bring. The only time your background matters to me is when you're an expert witness on a scientific topic. Bobo and crew place a lot of confidence in their witnesses because that's really all they have when it comes to evidence. Renee begins the conversation and mentions that the witness grew up in a culture that believes in Bigfoot. So they've been surrounded by this myth their whole life. How can bias not creep in? Sam and his wife Jennifer recount a time in 2013 that they saw a Bigfoot on their property. Sam says he was on his front porch and they heard a snapping off in the distance. It seems to be dark in the story, as Sam said he grabbed a flashlight and shined it on what he is calling a Bigfoot off in the distance on a trail. He said it was crouched down, and this intrigues Bobo. And of course, Bobo has to get his size estimate with himself as the analog. As he's walking down to the spot, he sees deer and elk prints. Now, us rational people would say, maybe homeboy saw a deer or an elk. But Bobo isn't rational. When he sees those tracks, he thinks, food for a Sasquatch. You see, believing in Bigfoot is not only a lifestyle, but it's a way of thinking. And that thinking is, everything is evidence of Bigfoot, even when it's not. And of course, the thing they saw is larger than Bobo, so it must have been a Bigfoot. Sam and Jennifer also said the creature's eyes started off to the side of its head. How could she tell that if it was dark and they had to use a flashlight to see? Come on now. Bobo heads back up to where Renee, Sam, and Jennifer are standing, and his first question is... When's the last time you guys have heard any Bigfoots around here? Had any kind of action? I heard something two nights ago. Oh. We hear them pretty often. For a couple of weeks, things will be really active, and then it seems to die down for a couple of months. Pretty much if you're out here for six months, you're going to hear something. They certainly didn't need us to tell them they saw a squatch. They know they saw a squatch. No doubt in their minds. No doubt in my mind. One point for Team USA. Believable witness. Notice how he phrased the question. When was the last time they heard anything from a Bigfoot? He's already dialed in. He believes their story. Sam and Jennifer are believers in Bigfoot, and they say you just have to hang around for six months to hear something. <laughs> well, gee, thanks. Let me set up my tent in your backyard and just wait for six months. 
Now this also counts as points for Bobo for a believable witness. Which brings the score to 4-1. to one. USA. Back in Canada, Cliff and Matt are meeting with Rob and Maria, one of the couples from the town hall. They're the ones that said they captured a photo of Bigfoot. Because their photograph is at such a distance that not a lot of details jump out. We need to figure out how large this thing is. If this is a towering eight and a half foot figure, then it's a slam dunk. We have a Sasquatch. Phrasing is almost as important as context. Notice that Cliff said the image was taken from a far distance, far from the subject. And it's really hard to make out the tiny shadow in between two trees. And he's calling it a Bigfoot. Now, if I saw that photo, I would say it's too far away to make out anything. And we can't say that it was a Bigfoot. Cliff, on the other hand, has already made up his mind. Instead of asking if this is a Bigfoot, he's asking, how big is this Bigfoot? He's already convinced that it's a Bigfoot in that photo. Maria and Rob recount their story about something walking down the road. Maria is very descriptive of this creature for being so far away. I'm suspect that she saw anything, let alone that much detail. Again, instead of questioning the validity of the story and the photograph, they jump right to sizing and how big this thing was. This is an interesting sighting. Maria saw something with her own eyes that her husband's camera only caught in passing. I can't say for sure what that figure was, but this is where being at the location and doing a recreation can tell you some very important things that a picture can't tell you on its own. Recreations aren't evidence. Typically, you use evidence to recreate a scene to help you better understand it. You don't use a recreation as actual evidence. Matt takes up his position in about the same spot as this creature, and Cliff, Maria, and Rob look onward. Cliff radios and says that Matt looks to be in the right position, and that this creature looks to be about the same size as Matt, or even smaller. Rob then snaps a few pictures of Matt with his cell phone, and they do a comparison of the two photos. The initial one Matt and Maria took by themselves, and the new one they just took. See, there's a figure right there. He's right there. Sunlight's beaming down on him. Looking at the figure over here in the original photograph, it's black or dark gray. But on you, your golden mane just jumps out at us, as well as the color of your flesh, compared to the color of your jacket, which yeah. is dark. Um, now, what was the weather like this August day? Very sunny. sunny. Very sunny. sunny. Warm. Any reason to wear a jacket? No. The we were in bathing suit. Yeah, the colors are dead on a Sasquatch, especially like when you see me, you know, you see light colored skin. Mm -hmm. And that looks like it has a darker around and then, and you know, even though it isn't towering above me, it doesn't mean it's not because we've been in many times where it was about the same size, but that doesn't mean it's a person. I'm comfortable saying this is very possibly a Sasquatch that you captured here. I'd say it's a probably. Right. What do you think? Oh, definitely. As soon as I saw it, I thought, that's a Sasquatch. One point for Team Canada. Believable witness. All right, there's just so much to unpack here. First, you're relying on the memory of these people to be accurate. The premise for their conclusion is that Matt is reflecting sunlight because of his light skin, which he is. They also posit that his jacket, which is dark, is not. And it's not. They then compare the two photos, and the alleged Bigfoot photo is not reflecting any light and they assume it's because the Bigfoot is covered in hair. I don't know why they think hair doesn't reflect light, but they do. They asked Rob and Maria if it was sunny the day they took the photo, and they say it was. But just the fact that it was sunny doesn't really prove anything. It's all about the angle of the sun. If the sun was at a different angle, or a cloud passed by, it would mess up the lighting. Hell, even the canopy of the trees would mess up the lighting. The trees would be fuller in August than in the fall, which is the time that they're in now. A denser canopy would let less light through. Never mind the fact that this creature is smaller than Matt. Never mind the fact that this creature is actually smaller than Matt. They just explain it away as a small Bigfoot. This interaction is enough to score them a credible witness point, making the score now 4-2 USA. We jump back to Bobo and Renee as they meet up with another eyewitness. Layla and Leah as they recount their experiences from 2008. So I know it was late 2008, but where exactly did this road crossing occur? It happened at milepost 218, right over there. It was at 9.30 at night. I was driving back right after my college class at City University. When I looked over to the right, 
And there he was. Who's he? About a, a 10 foot tall hominid of some kind. Some might call it a Sasquatch. It might have been Gigantopithecus. I'm really not sure. And it wasn't trying to run away. It just stood and watched. The gate was very large. It was larger than a 20 inch gate, which is approximately what a human would have. How do you know all this? Because I used to teach hominid studies. Oh, you did? After my sighting, yes. That got you into studying hominids? It did. I really wanted to research it after that. Uh huh. Layla saw something, wanted to learn more about it, and then took what she learned and applied it back to her memory to fill in the blanks. She changed what she remembered based on the new information that she learned. By the way, I think our boy Bobo was in love with this chick. Renee then goes on to ask her why she thought it was a Sasquatch. And then Leia shows Renee and Bobo a drawing she made of this creature's face. And then she goes on to say that she knew it was a Sasquatch. Coming down this highway here, what did you think you were looking at? I thought it was a Sasquatch. You immediately knew what you were looking at. Well, I knew that it was an unidentified species of hominid and it fit every description, every legend that I had ever heard. Yes. Sounds like she wants this thing to be a Bigfoot. I'm not sure I buy her story though. She seems biased. Renee says she feels a little sensitive because this is where Renee grew up and studied. All those years she's driven through these woods and highways, she's never seen anything resembling a Bigfoot. Leah then recounts her encounter on the same highway and she says that the eyes of this creature glowed red. She says that she was a skeptic, but after her encounter, she's a believer. Then she really wasn't a skeptic because a good skeptic would know that they needed more proof than a late night encounter and a personal experience. Of course, Bobo claims the women to be credible and counts two more points for the USA, bringing the score to six to two. Cliff and Matt better step up their game. They're falling behind. Speaking of, we cut back to Cliff and Matt getting ready for their nighttime investigation at Ruby Creek which is allegedly the site of the first recorded Bigfoot sighting in history. Apparently, they made a trace of the print way back in the day, and this is enough for Cliff to assume they'll find something. Cliff lets out a howl, and they wait. Matt hears something, but they can't quite make it out. They head down to the Ruby Creek, but Cliff hears something off to his left. He then stops Matt, and Cliff thinks he's heard a scream, but of course, they didn't catch it on their microphones. This is enough to convince Matt that it's not an owl or a coyote. Somehow it means a Bigfoot? They move off into the direction of the noise and they both let out their manly Bigfoot howls. I'm gonna do one. We heard that one call and then nothing for hours afterwards. We're basically looking for the smallest needle in the biggest haystack we've ever encountered. But I know the rules. Vocalizations are worth some points. I'll take every point we can get. Two points for Team Canada. Audio evidence. What the hell? They counted that as audio evidence? They didn't catch anything and spent hours trying to hear it again. It should be discarded, not counted as evidence. But because of that, the score is now 6-4 to four with Team USA still leading. We're at the halfway point of this little competition and the teams check in with each other to see how the others are doing. They talk a little trash and then they end their call. We start back up with Bobo and Renee. In order to cover more ground, they decide to split up and use some off-road vehicles to help them move around quicker. We get to tag along with Bobo first as he tries different Bigfoot lures. I'm not really sure what he's doing here, but this Bobo, he sure is a strange fellow. The first lure is what Bobo calls the hunter. Let's hear his rationale for this. Big hunters have the most settings, A, because they're quiet. A lot of them put scent block on, wearing camo. They're out at daybreak and dusk when squatches are acting. So they're going to act like a typical hunter, get a gun and stuff. Might be able to entice one in that way. Sure, Bobo, whatever you say. You're the expert here. However, he's not done. He's going to piss all over the place to mark his turf. The sun finally sets, and yes, we do get a shot of Bobo taking a piss and taunting Bigfoot. I will not subject you to that scene, my dear listeners. It's bad enough that I'm putting you through this show as it is. 
Bobo then does his best Bigfoot howl, and we just wait, and wait, and wait, until the next scene, which is to say a little disturbing. Well, I struck out with the hunter technique, so I'm gonna try something a little more drastic this time. I got a new approach. Squatch ain't always pretty, but today it is. Since this is a solo investigation, I couldn't bring a female with me, so I gotta be the female. My God, what did I just watch? Bobo and drag beating his wood? Some things you just can't unsee. <laughs> Bobo, still dressed in drag, is walking through the woods trying to entice the Bigfoot with his sexiness. This, of course, does nothing, and we cut back to Cliff and Matt in Canada. They're in the car discussing the town hall meeting and reference the guy who was chased by a Bigfoot while mountain biking. They arrive at Sasquatch Provincial Park for their investigation. Matt is convinced they'll find something here in Sasquatch Provincial Park because they can't name it that without there being Sasquatch there. This is a relatively recent multiple witness sighting, and if it's in Sasquatch Provincial Park, then that's strong evidence that there are Sasquatches in Sasquatch Provincial Park. Well then, let's just call this mystery solved. Again, notice his reliance on eyewitnesses to corroborate their belief. It's just so blatant and, and so easy to call out, it's as if they're doing it on purpose. I know they're not, but it feels like they are sometimes. They meet up with Todd and Sylvia to recount their experience. They're cruising down a trail and notice a Sasquatch off to the right. This thing charges after them and they hightail it out of Dodge before it was too late. Sylvia said it had long gray hair and long hairy arms and walked between on all fours and upright. Of course they want to get a size reference and Cliff heads into the spot they think this thing was. But listen to how he's already twisting his conclusion. Since we're here, we might as well go up there and take a look and see how big this thing really was. I'm going to go up on the hill to about where they saw it to try to figure out how big this thing might have been. Now, if it's only my height or so, that might have been like a rogue grizzly because they have a grayish tinge of their hair as well. But if it's a lot bigger than me, like a lot bigger than me, we're left with no other option but a Sasquatch. No other option, Cliff. You ruled out every single option and conclude that this has to be a Sasquatch? Really? As Cliff gets into position, Matt speculates as to why this Sasquatch was chasing these people off in the first place. One could only guess why the Sasquatch was trying to scare these people out of the area, but the topography gives me a clue. It'd be very difficult for deer to walk through here and any other pathway except the same pathway that they were riding the bike along. So if the Sasquatch was laying in wait up there, it wouldn't have wanted people down there potentially scaring off the deer that it was waiting for. Yes. One can only guess, just like you did. You just made that shit up based on nothing more than fantasy and speculation. Our boy Cliff's not going to be left out. He has to speculate without any evidence as well. I think what was going on here is that this Sasquatch did not want them in the area, so it charged at them. It's a bluff charge. That's exactly the sort of behavior that one can see if they watch chimpanzees or gorillas doing bluff charges. They don't just stomp their feet and run at them. They actually grab things on the ground and throw things and make noise and make a big, huge ruckus. That's what the Sasquatch was doing. How do I know it's a bluff charge? Because Sylvia and Todd are not dead. And if a Sasquatch wanted to get them, they'd be gone. Oh, okay. That makes sense now chimpanzees and gorillas do it, and these two witnesses are still alive. That's their rationale for this. Sorry to doubt you, wise old Cliff and Matt. You know these made-up creatures so well. It's as if you're just making up stuff as you go along and calling it evidence. This was enough to convince Cliff and Matt that they tally another point for... Believable Witness. It's now 6 to 5 USA. But wait, they didn't do their size comparison. What the hell? How are we supposed to know how big this thing was? And that's how we tell if it was a Bigfoot, right? Ah, never mind that now. Cliff and Matt decide to split up with Cliff heading out to meet a friend that swears he's had six daylight sightings in the past four years. You ever wonder why Bigfoot evidence is so hard to come by? It's not because they don't exist. I'll let Cliff explain why. If you want to know what sort of mammals are in the area, you can't just sit around hoping to see one. You have to go out and look for their sign, like footprints and scat and whatnot. Now, Sasquatches are smarter than your average mammal, so finding their sign would be exponentially more difficult. That's right. It's not because they don't exist. 
It's because they are smarter than your average mammal and cover their tracks and shit so well. Now it all makes perfect sense. Cliff notices a mud patch and several footprints to include bears, deer, and even a bobcat. He then implies that since these animals are here, a Bigfoot must be here too. He doesn't explain his conclusion, he just states it as a matter of fact. He continues into the woods and notices a branch broken in a particular way. What in the world? This piece here was taken off of this stretch here, pulled back and twisted a little bit on top. And this was removed from right there. It fits like a puzzle piece. Even with the torn bark, this is perfect. I've never seen that before, because whatever that is was placed here. That is not a natural formation. That doesn't happen on accident. That's not nature at work. That's something with hands. Now, the property owner is the only guy out here, and I happen to know he owns a very large arsenal of guns, so I'm pretty sure no one else is out here either. If Cliff is walking and found that, one could then conclude that another human could walk through that same location and could have broken that branch. He just jumps to a Bigfoot. But since we don't have hard evidence of their existence, I'm thinking another animal or human. Because of this, Cliff thinks this is a good spot to start his nighttime investigation, and he gets two points for physical evidence? You gotta be kidding me. Ugh, oh, guys are terrible. With that, it's now 7-6, to six, with Team Canada finally on top. We jump over to Matt, and he's investigating a power line cut because Bigfoots use these for travel. How he knows this, he doesn't say. He also says deer use these cuts for travel too, and this is relevant because Bigfoots can set up ambushes here. Or so he claims. Matt then does his best Bigfoot howl and waits. But meanwhile, we cut back to Cliff, who says that wildlife biologists have tracked five different mountain lions in the area, and Cliff is understandably a little nervous. He's then searching the woods for a heat signature, and notices something close by giving off heat. There's something right there. It's gotta be right there, what is that thing? Oh. Is that what I think it is? It's a paper wasp nest. Didn't know those would be warm. Learn something every day. I included this scene because it shows that any number of things in the woods can give off a heat signature that could be confused with Bigfoot sightings if you're looking for Bigfoots. Who's to say that during their other investigations that they didn't see a paper wasp nest or some other non-Bigfoot item and think it was a Bigfoot? They jumped to Bigfoot unless they're right on top of it. But their first assumption should be not Bigfoot until we can rule out other known creatures. But that doesn't conform to their preconceived bias. Cliff continues on his way and lets out a howl, as you do. He hears something behind him and looks for a heat signature. He doesn't see anything, but thinks whatever is there is tracking him, so he continues on his way. Maybe it was a bobcat. We move back to Bobo, and after striking out with his hunter and drag gimmick, he has one more gimmick up his sleeve. I think squatches feel pretty unthreatened when they see hippies, because I doubt hippies are shooting at them very much. I think this technique's gonna have a lot more luck. I'm gonna make a lot of tie-dye hanging out in the trees, show those squatches I'm a tree hugger, not a hunter, make them feel safe. We got nothing to worry about. People speculate your squatches see colors. I think they do, because I've heard they like red balls the most. People that live in the woods and have kids said the red balls always disappeared first. So I think they can see color, I'd imagine. But we don't know. Man, I'm super good at this. I'm serious, man. You might see me at craft fairs doing tie-dye shirts. This could be my calling. Welcome to Camp Smelly Hippie. Hippies will tell you when they play their drum circles out in the woods, they've had a lot of squatch encounters. So we're gonna try to bring a few percussion instruments together and just make a racket out here. I really don't know what to say outside of what up moron. 
All their evidence is based on personal experience and secondhand accounts. There's nothing remotely resembling science being done here. They're just guessing and coming up with hypotheses about Bigfoots. They like red because when he was a kid, the red balls always went missing. What the hell? What more do I need to say about these people? They're just so ridiculous. It's nighttime now and Bobo is playing with his drums. After banging his drum for a few minutes, he looks around his camp to see if he's attracted any Sasquatches. As he's exploring, he hears something and spots a moving object off into the distance. All my hair standing. I'm gonna try to call this way. The thing is, those calls are coming directly behind the tie-dye down the mountain. The drums might have worked. That's it. That's all you get, folks. Nothing more. Some more time passes, and apparently that noise he heard counts as evidence. And two more points. It's now 8-7 with USA back on top. Yeah, that's right, baby. Back on top. USA number one. We join Cliff and Matt as they head out to meet up with local BFRO members at 20 Mile Bay, the alleged location of several sightings. They narrow down a location and head that way. We jump back to Bobo and Renee, and Renee seems impressed with what Bobo recorded, so they decided to head back to that location for their final nighttime investigation. Joe, a local crackpot, is going to help these two get deeper into the woods. He has a big ass deuce and a half all camoed out. This loud ass truck is going to help them how? They're going to equip this truck with a 360 degree bubble FLIR camera to search for heat signatures. We get an equipment shut up montage and we're ready to roll. Back over to our friends in Canada, Cliff, Matt, and the local BFRO team split up into two teams, with Cliff going low and Matt going high to do their howling gimmick. Matt has a new toy, an audio amplifier. He's using this because according to him, the responses he's getting are just on the edge of hearing. So this little device is sure to find what he considers evidence. Matt lets out his little yelp and we cut back to Team USA. They're rolling down the road with their fancy equipment looking for anything that moves. They have a PA system installed and will blast Bigfoot calls into the night. And we're back with Cliff, who's going to do some knocks and wait for a response. We then cut back to Matt and he radios Cliff. They can barely hear each other over the radio, but Matt is letting Cliff know he's going to be howling and to see if Cliff can hear him. Cliff says that since they didn't get a response from the knock, it's time to escalate the call. Cliff is sure there are Bigfoots here because he says, After no responses from the knock, we had to escalate the calls. After all, if the Bigfoots aren't close enough to hear the knock, maybe they're close enough to hear our howls because the echoes in these canyons are fantastic. Yeah, you didn't get a response because the Bigfoots didn't hear you. It's not because they don't exist. Silly. Matt lets out his howl and turns on his audio amplifier. Cliff then does his howl. We wait and we get nothing. They decide to wait it out a little longer and then move on to another canyon. Back to Team USA, who is still driving through the woods looking at their monitors, and they catch something on their camera. Renee decides to jump out and investigate. Bobo was in the truck watching Renee. She notes that there are many ambient sounds like frogs and owls. She wants Bobo to use the PA and blast some howls into the woods. After Bobo does his call, they search the woods with their cameras, waiting for something to appear. And then they see movement on the screen and send Renee to investigate. What is that? Yeah, there it is. I mean, that, that clearly had legs going. Yeah. Renee, reverse your course. And go back to where you just came from because we saw something walk in the distance. I wonder if it was you. Okay, copy. I'll go back in the same direction.
Yeah, yep. there she is. Copy, and she you looked pretty squatchy for a second. Damn, I thought they had something. But good for them for testing their hypothesis and eliminating a possible variable. Turns out, it was just Renee. False alarm, folks. Nothing to see here. We join Matt and Cliff in their desperate search for anything resembling what they consider evidence. A few more howls and Matt hears something roar back to him through his amplifier. I can't be sure that was a squatch, so whatever it was, I can't count it as a point. Good for you, Matt. You don't need those cheap points like Bobo and Renee are claiming. Back to Team USA and Bobo wants Joe to do his best Bigfoot call. <laughs> hell was that? Why are there so many different calls? Which one is an actual Bigfoot call? You have two different groups with two different calls, all claiming to get responses when they do their calls. There's no consistency here. It's just whatever you get what you think is a response, and you just go with it and call it evidence. Joe's call fails to elicit a response, and Bobo calls it a night with zero points. Cliff and Matt also come away with zero points. We are in the final stretch, and the two teams meet back up to determine the winner. I know you're all on pins and needles here. Well, you may not be because you already know the score if you've been paying attention. And Bobo won. Oh, sorry. Spoiler alert. At the end of this investigation, we can say both teams are winners. Except for Team Canada, because they lost. But my experiences here has inspired me to keep squatching in my home state of Washington. The bottom line here is that we spread out and we learned a lot about the Bigfoots in two different areas, which is the point of this whole thing anyway. Typical talk of a loser. A winner <laughs> here says, I want to collect my bet for winning. We won that bet. I won that cast. I couldn't ask for a better person for a track like this to go to, because I know Bubba will take care of it. And honestly, if he had to give up his Dustin Pedroia bat and give it to me, who doesn't really care about sports so much, I'd kind of feel bad. After all, it is only one cast. I've got 71 others. Mm, smells like victory. <laughs> <laughs> well, Cliff and Matt didn't get any points for me with the state A-list tribe. And that's just mind-blowing. I got to hear screams I never heard before. That was awesome. It was a win, 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 win for everybody, especially America. All right, let's get going, yeah. boys. In the end, the U.S. team scored more points than Team Canada, but that's okay because they were on familiar turf. And Cliff and I were in a place that we had never been before, so that may have had something to do with it. But from all this work we did this time, I think we can confidently say the Pacific Northwest, including both the U.S. and Canada, is the squatchiest place on Earth. The evidence threshold for this team is so low that I hesitate to use the term evidence. From the outset of this episode, we knew what was going to be considered evidence in their minds and it was physical, audio, and credible witnesses. They didn't present any physical or audio, or at least what I would consider evidence in support of their claim that Bigfoots are real. They heard a few noises, almost got shot, spoke with some native people, and found a broken branch. That's it. They didn't find footprints, scat, or anything resembling a Bigfoot habitat. Granted, it was a large area they were searching, but from how they tell it, these places should be teeming with Bigfoots. But they're not. They're still convinced that they found something, but I'm not. One aspect that is extremely telling, and I mentioned this throughout the episode and in other Finding Bigfoot episodes, is a reliance on eyewitnesses. Most of their points came from what they call credible eyewitnesses. This is what they do to bolster their claims. They find people they think are credible and use their experiences as evidence. They also use cultural artifacts of native people as evidence as well. This is cool when studying anthropology, but not when you're searching for hard scientific evidence of an unknown cryptid. 
All this episode did was provide support for their preconceived belief that Bigfoots are real. This is one of the highest rated shows on Animal Planet, and I sincerely hope people are watching it ironically. But sadly, I don't think that's the case. This has been Paranormal Skeptic Academy. If you like what I do, head on over to patreon.com slash PSA. And for as little as $2 an episode, you could help support my efforts. Each patron will receive the video version of the normal episodes, along with a special RSS feed to add to your favorite podcatcher. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at CWeb619. Send me feedback at paranormalskepticacademy at gmail.com. Like the Facebook page and leave me a review on iTunes and Stitcher. This has been Paranormal Skeptic Academy, schooling your favorite ghost hunters. For a complete list of resources used in the making of this episode, please head over to ParanormalSkepticAcademy.com and click on the link for this episode.